Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast. I am Race for the Prize. Let's look at the salaries for the Cup Series at Richmond. Who's a good deal at the bottom? Who's a good point per dollar deal at the top? As always, go to racefortheprize.com to get access to the Richmond sheet for the weekend, 10 bucks. Or maybe you want to look ahead to April. The package is listed, 30 bucks, 10 whopping sheets. Go get them. Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. If you can't do that, I understand. Leave a like then. Subscribe to the videos, share the videos, leave comments. Love responding to the comments. Love you guys. Daniel Hemrick, as I live and breathe, $5,000 for a college car. Can you believe it? I know it's not a $4,500 driver, but to get the cheapest driver in a college car, yeah, it hasn't been the greatest season. And Phoenix was a bit of a debacle, was down two laps at one point. He did get back on the lead lap, which is encouraging. But then he did nothing once he got back on the lead lap. But again, at $5,000, I won't completely rule him out. I'm not really looking at Kaz Grala, but we should put some respect on his name because the Rick Ware cars did both earn top 20s at Bristol. I know Bristol was a funky race. And you may say, well, we've got to disregard that because of all those situations. Here's the reality. Everyone was facing the same circumstances. And in those circumstances, you would expect good cars to finish better and bad cars to not overcome. Well, they did performed and so we do need to put a little bit of respect on these rick Ware cars they ain't the same rick Ware cars that we had seen in the past they are doing things right they are making good moves i'm not saying that he's going to be great but i really i've got to get in the habit of not just dismissing kaz Grala at rick Ware really quickly now i will dismiss harrison burton pretty quickly just things aren't working out it's not going in the right direction I would rather go to Kaz Grala, I, I think. Um, really, the de- deciding factor would be place differential. I would rather go to Daniel Henry. But again, if I'm absolutely punting in this position where I don't think any of these drivers are going to run well and are going to need a lot of help, which I don't think they're necessarily going to get a lot of help at Richmond. I'm not expecting chaos. It's just going to be maximizing place differential. A little bit more excited about rostering Haley. again. If we look at these finishes, they're not bad for Rick Ware. I know we've got to dismiss the plate tracks, but 24th at Phoenix, I know there was some attrition there, but he kept it clean. Have we rostered J.J. Yaley at Rick Ware and just hope that he keep kept it clean? Now, typically, we've got J.J. Yaley a little bit cheaper, but if you get Haley, not Yaley, starting in the back, and it looks like he knows what he is doing in this Rick Ware car, and what the approach should be, then you know why not go in that direction? Why not make that a play that we could consider? I don't love it, especially early in the week, but if you remember on Twitter, before that Phoenix race, I had not considered Haley all week. And then as I poured over the numbers, and as I thought through the race, and as I went through the builds, I talked myself into Haley. I tweeted about talking myself into Haley. I talked about confirmation bias and looking for stats that would defend my stance. And wouldn't you know it, Haley ends up with a solid day and ends up in the optimal line. Ty Dillon, not bad equipment for Colleg. Last year, not great for Spire. Spire, as good as they are at times, they have had seemingly every year a good car and a bad car and this year we'll talk about in a second two good cars and a bad car which is not surprising who among us expects spire to have wall-to-wall talent and wall-to-wall good cars that doesn't exist on any team when we look at hendrick there's always going to be a car that either underperforms or is the slug of the team and that's going to exist on a three-car spire team that even existed in a two-car spire team One gets the resources, one's just, hey, man, we got this charter or whatever. So I'm not going to get crazy about Dylan not having great finishes. You go back to 2022, Legacy Motor Club, a little bit better equipment. He finished the 17th, he finishes 24th. Put him in a college car. 24th is not out of the question. 25th is not out of the question. He didn't forget how to race, folks. $5,400 Ty Dylan. I mean, we go back to the Germain days against some pretty competitive fields in equipment where there was a clear divide between the haves and have-nots. We are much more equalized 
the field I would argue is not nearly as competitive. And to be in a call of car at 5,400, you're playing him with Jermaine. That 13 Geico ride at 5,400, I would argue that this is a better situation at this price than when you had to play him in the 13 Geico. But a Geico get your money. Da -da 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 -da. Todd Gillen, Mr. Top 25. And he's pretty much been Mr. Top 25 at Richmond over his career. This year hasn't quite been Mr. Top 25. Just on the outside. Not very good, but he's close. Uh, my concern is not only is he a not top 25 guy, but we go to Michael McDowell. He has also struggled, so it could be a front row issue. Maybe they're going to dig into the notes and find out what RFK is doing because RFK is doing pretty good. Zane Smith, here's the situation I want to approach with Zane Smith. Remember, he's not necessarily a Spire driver. He is a track house driver on loan. Who's getting the resources at Spire? Who's getting the results at Spire? It's their guys, Corey LaJoy. It's their guys, Carson Hosever. They have the better crew chiefs in Luke Lambert. I don't think Ryan Sparks is the greatest crew chief ever, but he's been there for a while. Zane Smith's got a crew chief in Stephen Doran, who really has about six races under his belt. This is a thrown together ride. This is their tertiary. We just got a charter. We got it from BJ last minute. We're just chilling. This is an underfunded ride. I think when we get further into the season, we might start to consider Zane Smith the Rick Ware of the year. Look at these finishes, folks. This Spire ride is not getting resources. It is not getting attention, and rightfully so. He's a track house driver. The crew chief has no experience. There's always going to be a third car on the team. Mark my words, in a couple weeks, Zane Smith will be the guy that is down here. He will be the Rick Ware driver of the year. Corey LaJoy never really putting anything together. Halfway decent at times during that Phoenix race, but then ultimately gets collected in the wreck. Carson Hosever, we don't have any experience here. 15th at Phoenix. Ultimately, a pretty good race, overcome some situations. We like the direction that he is heading in. I'm not super bullish. Not crazy about Stenhouse either. A bit of a no man's land. We'll see how place differential works out. Just typical Stenhouse season so far. I can't figure out Austin Sendrick. You want to roster him? I don't know. We'll see how practice is. Um, again, you're going to have to look close to practice because the Group A times will be inflated once the track rubbers up and you're in Group B. You're going to get a better adjustment and a better idea of how to set the setup, which is beneficial to the driver, but it's going to be misleading to everyone out there. So if Austin Cindric goes out in a super fast in Group A, that's kind of an ideal situation. We will know Fade City. We will know he doesn't really have speed. And the people that don't really pay that much attention to Fantasy NASCAR will say 6,200, he was top five in practice. It was Group A, folks. You put him in Group B, he would have probably been 27th in practice. And then he finishes in 27th, and people go, what happened? But knowing our luck, he'll probably put it in Group B, and then we'll have to really pour through the data. John Hunter Nemechek, it is a Toyota. So we could get a little bit of speed out of him. Not bad so far. Maybe he is this year's Todd Gillen turning out these top 25 finishes. Won't rule him out 6,400. I'd honestly probably like him better than Stenhouse. A lot of unknowns with Hosevar, but I do probably lean into Hosevar a little bit. But nah, I might take Nemechek, who has been solid at Richmond in the Xfinity Series. Should have won this race in the Xfinity Series last year had they not played stupid games and got stupid prizes. Um, you go back to him battling with Ty Gibbs in the past. Pretty solid driver. Ryan Priest, this is the one that you really like at 6,500. Stuart Haas Racing Fords had really good race cars across the board at Richmond last season. But it's a new package. All right, well, in the new package, they were also great at Phoenix. He finished 23rd, but if you watch the video where I broke it down, he was one of those drivers that made a strategy call at the end. He ran out of fuel, 
had to pit, was running second, I believe, or third. He couldn't make it work. So his finish was a lot worse than it could have been. Now, he wasn't great, but he was close to a top 15 driver, which you will take at $6,500. Eric Jones is probably going to be popular this week. He's going to get enough attention. Hopefully enough people looked at the laps at Phoenix and could see that when he wasn't in dirty air, he had pretty good speed. Now, he is going to be in dirty air this week, but at 6,600, that's okay. You know, we look at a guy like, say it's Martin Trucks Jr., he gets in dirty air and he can't lead laps. That kills us because we need you to be up front. We need laps led at that price point. We can't have you struggle in dirty air. You've got to be able to pass. 6,600, we don't necessarily need Jones to pass. We just need him to run where he's capable of running. And it almost sorted itself out. He had worked his way back to the top 10 in that Phoenix race and then gets collected in the Bubba Wallace wreck uh, at a point in stage three. Austin Dillon's been really good at Richmond. RCR was really good at Richmond last season. We didn't really get to see anything from Phoenix. Now, we did get to see Kyle Busch struggle all day on the track and on pit road. Austin Dillon gets in a very early wreck. So a lot of questions in terms of this new short track package for RCR. Did they collect enough data? Did they learn anything? And even if they did learn and improve, Toyota's going to get better. Hendrick's going to get better. The SHR Fords are going to get better. Now at 6,800, we can be a little bit more forgiving. Probably not the case for Kyle Busch. And even with Kyle Busch and his good race at Richmond last year, he was never really in contention. Where is Kyle? Because he's not cheap. 9,700, finishes third. Did everything right on pit road. Ran really well. But even with that being the case, three hog points. Not somewhere I am really interested at all. And you add in the Phoenix situation. But with Austin Dillon at a significantly lower price tag and a guy that's been able to figure it out. Again, mentioning that in Group B, he was not fast in practice. But that was fine. As soon as they got racing, they just got better and better and better. McDowell, as I mentioned before, really bad fall race. Just didn't run well in practice, didn't run well in the race. Hasn't run well here in the past. Gregson participated in the test last year for Legacy Motor Club Chevys with a different crew chief. Maybe he learned something. He is having a good season. Toyota has speed. Now, how much of that speed is going to go to Legacy Motor Club? We know 2311, JGR is going to have it. But if we go back to Phoenix, Jones had speed. Gregson was making moves at the end. It's very encouraging at 7,100. If you can get up to it, I don't mind whatsoever. 7,300 Suarez isn't really saving us that much, and I don't think he's offering much upside. Really bad race at Richmond in the fall. Josh Berry, that second place, has really benefited by a lucky dog at the perfect ideal time. He still did finish second, subbing for Chase Elliott, but I would take it with a grain of salt. Chase Briscoe has been really good at this racetrack. Stuart Haas Ford has been really good last year. They were really good. At Phoenix this year, for whatever reason, in the next-gen package, Briscoe has really excelled. I guess it's the shifting at the short flat tracks. 7,600, that's a pretty good deal. He offers upside. Will he get fast laps in the laps left? Well, he could get fast laps because, as we have said in previous podcasts, fast laps get distributed at this race. Might as well pull that up. We can look at your hog points, dominator points, lap sled points. And you're going to see they are really spread out. Now, yeah, it's top heavy with 64 on average for the guy with the most. And then it cuts in half. But then we're even looking at seven drivers with 10 or more. Imagine you get 10 fast lap points from Chase Briscoe. And then five place differential points from Briscoe. And then a top 10, ding, 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 you have hit. A lot of fast laps will get distributed because of cycling. A lot of fast laps will get distributed because of no tire, two tire. A lot of fast laps will get distributed because some people might try to split the Sage into thirds. It's Richmond, baby. It is Richmond. Get used to it. As we go through these drivers moving forward, you can say, oh, well, I don't know if he can get the finish. But everybody we're about to mention can all get fast laps. Speaking of fast laps, Bubba Wallace led the third most laps last year at Richmond. A comedy of errors, as I mentioned in my free. DraftKings Network article this week on pit road. He and Tyler Reddick just threw the race away. 
Now they're in fast Toyotas again. Yeah, I like Bubba Wallace at 7,700. I might lean a little bit more into Briska. Let's continue on. Alex Bowman at $8,000. Is that too much for Alex Bowman? I mean, that's the first thought that crosses my mind. And I imagine it's going to cross the mind of most people. And if that's the case, then it's not too much. Maybe we can get some leverage. Not really good at Richmond last year, but he does have some pretty solid races in the past. But I don't really want to dig too deep in some of the Richmond data to try to find some sort of confirmation bias reason to play Alex Bowman. Wasn't really good at Phoenix. He did have stints in that race where he did run well. And I think overall, Hendrick was pretty solid in that race. And they're going to get buried a little bit. The Toyotas were so good. And we had higher expectations for Hendrick. And although Hendrick did disappoint and didn't win the race, across the industry, the general feel, regular NASCAR meet is that, oh, Hendrick, what's wrong with Hendrick? That's going to drive some storylines. There's not really a huge story there. Um, Chase Elliott and William Byron really had top five dry cars. They made the wrong pit decision at the end of the race. It really hurt their finishing position. Again, yeah, Bowman is not great, but he has been better over the last couple races, although they may not be the best measure because Bristol was Bristol and you have a road course. But at least in terms of positive momentum, Bowman does have that going in his direction. But overall general feeling, yeah, Larson did disappoint a little bit as well. But sure, Toyota is still light years ahead of Hendrick. And even if Hendrick tried to close the gap, maybe Toyota widened the gap. And that's a possibility. But to just simplify it as Hendrick is not very good at the moment. That's that's way too simple. If you look at the data, you're not too discouraged by the performance of William Byron at Phoenix or Chase Elliott, even for that matter. Breck Kozlowski should have won this race last year. Pit road mistake at the end costs it for him, and it goes to his teammate. He leads the most laps. They're really making gains. I keep saying it week after week. been doing this since last season, I suppose, that you really got to start believing in the RFK Fords. If not now, then when? What do they have to do to impress you? Solid finish at Phoenix, finishing fourth. Although he did admit that, yes, we're not close to Toyota. We're good. We're positive. We're moving in the right direction. We're not close to Toyota. Now, that's forgivable at $8,200. That may not be the case with his teammate. At 9300 although he did absolutely crush. Busher crushed. Drove through the field. Poor qualifying effort. Again, you got group A, group B situation, but just walks through the field. Runs away with this race. RFK was fast. Fast forward, new package. He did finish second at Phoenix, but that was a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Playing some strategy, getting it right. Top 10 car, arguably, maybe top five. But at 9,300, we need a little bit more certainty. We need a guarantee that we're going to lead laps and run fast laps. Now, if you can run in the top five, the way cycling and all that works out with Richmond, it's a possibility. But you can say the same for Toyota. And you can feel a lot more confident in their speed. At 9,300, it becomes a bit of a concern unless we get a bunch of place differential. At 8,200 with Brad Kozlowski, we may not necessarily need laps led. We don't need laps led. We need a top finish, scrape off some fast laps, get us some place differential, which he hasn't been qualifying that well this year. We can definitely get on board there. Logano, track history is going to check out. And he did have one of his better races last year at Richmond in the fall. Fast forward to this season, boy, I'm just not excited about Penske. Blaney was fine. Blaney got a top five, had a sixth highest driver rating at Phoenix, but sixth isn't going to cut it. That's well behind the Toyotas at the price you're going to pay for Blaney. So by no means, oh, Blaney's toast, Blaney's dead, Penske's dead. No, but there's a clear separation. And if we're chasing hog points or laps led fast lap points, then it's a tougher call with Blaney. And this hasn't really been his best racetrack either. But you go to Lugano, it's a little bit of the reverse. This has been a really good racetrack for him, but his career overall is just not turning in the right direction. I know he got in an incident at Phoenix, but before he even got into that incident, he put himself in a place to get into an incident. He was running outside of the top 25. He was not having a good day. They've got a lot of, to figure out. And 
another situation is, all right, so if you're behind the eight ball a little bit and you're a team trying to figure things out, this is not really the place that, or the situation that you want to be in. This is not the time of the season where you want to try and start figuring things out. Let's play this out. We got two plate races, intermediate, new short track package, back to the intermediate at Bristol with asphalt or concrete back and a resin substance that we know nothing about for the first time, that crazy mixture. Then we're road coursing. Imagine you're an engineer for Penske and you're struggling. Now you got to go back and try to figure out the short track package for Richmond. You are juggling so much. You're going back and forth. For a team that's hitting things right or a team that is a step ahead, they should stay a step ahead. These guys, I don't know. I would be really concerned if they can get dialed in. And before he's going to lead laps and run fast laps, he's got to get top 10s. Now at his price, a top 10 might work. So we can't completely eliminate Joey Logano, but I would much rather go Brackislowski. Ross Chastain really struggled last year at Richmond. We knew he had that summer slump where Trackhouse just couldn't put things together. His Phoenix finish is inflated, probably had a 15th place Chevy, finishes sixth. So if the field is going to be excited in DFS about Ross Chastain at 8,500 because he finished sixth, he did not have six speed, I will gladly leverage that opportunity. Gladly. Richmond and well, it's not a good race for them last year. Again, the Chevys overall, maybe some concerns. I don't know. Uh, here's another story I want to float out there is that Trackhouse, not the biggest team. They have to decide where they're going to put their resources. And if I'm Trackhouse, it's going to go into plates. It's going to go into road courses. And then maybe from there, I'm going into intermediate tracks. But heading into this season, I don't know how invested Trackhouse was in the new short track package at the short tracks. Just throwing it out there. They're never going to equally distribute their resources and their time and their data models. If there was a place where I would expect Trackhouse to not necessarily struggle, but not lead a bunch of laps and run a bunch of fast laps, it would be Richmond. It would be some of these other tracks. That doesn't mean they don't put a bunch of resources into Phoenix because it is a championship race, but we got a Richmond race beginning of the year sandwiched between a bunch of wild different racetracks. And then you got just a regular old July race that gets kind of forgotten. I wouldn't be that concerned. Tyler Reddick, as I mentioned before, like his teammate Bubba Wallace, he also led the third most laps. He also had situations on pit road. He was the second highest driver. Rated driver at Las Vegas. He was the second highest rated driver at Phoenix. Yes, please. At 8,700, what are we even talking about? So if we are slightly considering Ross Chastain, no, you're not. You're playing Tyler Reddick. If you're slightly considering playing Joe Logano, no, you're not. You're playing Tyler Reddick. Even Brett Kozlowski, you try to find a way up to Tyler Reddick because he's got a fast car and he's been fast here. And so let's say place differentials aside, because we don't know where these drivers are going to start. Finishing position, ask yourself, who has the best upside? Maybe you make an argument for Keselowski, but based on this year's speed and what should have been at Richmond last year, it's Reddick. All right, next question. Among these four drivers, who has the best chance of scraping off fast laps while not necessarily leading laps? I believe that's easily going to be Tyler Reddick. Now, you could make a case for Brad Kozlowski going with a different pit cycle strategy and then getting some points that way. That's a fine argument, but in both situations, we are leaning towards Tyler Reddick. Chase Elliott, $9,000. You would think this racetrack would have been better to him in the past, and he does have three top fives in recent races. But as I was thinking, like I don't remember him ever really leading a bunch of laps at this racetrack, so we go ahead and look at it. I think you're going to find out on our board, on average, just seven hog points. He did have one good race where he got 28 in the fall of 2021. But this has not been one of his better racetracks, which is slightly surprising. Busher, we know the story. Crushed this race last year. Let's see how practice goes. Although, again, practice can be misleading. Did have a pretty good day at Phoenix. Uh, bigger stories to Toyota. We talked about Ryan Blaney. We talked about Kyle Busch. Let's go to the top and look at our elite. 
So it comes down to the four JGR Toyotas and then the two Hendrick cars. And for my money, let's just go ahead and say it's the four Toyotas and then the two Hendricks. Byron had an incident on pit road last year, killed his result. Very early, had a decent car before that. In the spring race, he was on his way to leading the most laps, running the most fast laps. Late race restart, Christopher Bell wrecks him. Race goes to Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson was really fast. More than likely benefits from Byron having that incident. That was kind of the story last year. Larson would be better and then Byron would steal the win. Byron was better at Richmond and then Larson took the win. Then in the fall race, they just missed the setup completely. They were sliding. They couldn't get grip. They were tight. That is worrisome because they didn't really have the greatest setup at Phoenix either. When the package has changed, can't rule him out, but there's enough of a reason to say that these guys are five and six on my board in terms of laps, leaders, fast laps. So then obviously we're just going to put Ty Gibbs at $10,000, who has had a $2,000 price increase. He'll be fourth on my board. He ran well. His finish was a little bit inflated at Phoenix because of that great restart at the end, but overall was a top five driver. He was not the fastest of the team. Fastest was Christopher Bell. You're jamming him in. No worries here. Jamming Christopher Bell. We're good to go. Pit road penalty hurts Bell's finish. This was one of his best tracks in the Xfinity Series. He's been good here in the Cup Series. No brainer. Martin Tricks Jr. had equal speed. Maybe we have some long runs. Even if he doesn't win the race, the way that cycling plays out, you like his ability to lead laps on long runs, play slightly different strategies, and his willingness of James Small's crew chief to play different strategies, whereas it may not maximize finishing position, it at times can increase his ability to earn laps led. Not necessarily fast laps on old tires, but it definitely can boost those fantasy points that get you into a top three, top two day. Hamlin, look at these Richmond numbers. He was fast at Phoenix uh, before he spun out. But one of the things that you absolutely love about Denny Hamlin is his fast pit crew. And for my money, speed on pit road might be more than speed on the racetrack. Just get out into clean air and score some fantasy points. So a strong argument can be made that at 11-2, Denny Hamlin is your guy. Now, one thing I want to mention, I tweeted this out earlier this week. In previous Richmond races, at least the last four, it's a small sample size, I know, but they are all next-gen cars, which makes it unpredictable. Now, this is another change this year, but look, we didn't spend over $10,000 for any of these drivers. We did in the spring at 10.6, 10.3. We're being asked to spend 11.2 on Denny Hamlin. That's a pretty steep price tag. We go back to the first races in the next gen car where there was a little bit more unknowns. Again, no $10,000 drivers. We know a little bit more about the next gen car now, but in a way we don't because of the package. However, DraftKings got pretty aggressive with our pricing. And like, who could surprise us a little bit and give us a cheap leader? Busher could be that guy. Tyler Reddick could be the guy like we have seen in the past. Kozlowski, maybe. Maybe you want to throw Bob Wallace in there. I don't know. That's a little extreme, but he did it last year. Either way, where we stand, yeah. Denny Hamlin, Christopher Bell, Martin Truex, number one. Uh, I mean, you pick your poison. Pick two poisons, I would say. And then I would go to Gibbs. I would lean to Byron based on them being pretty close with the setup at Phoenix. And then Larson's number five, which is kind of surprising, but that's what the data suggests at this point. And really, this was never one of his great racetracks. When we look at the development of Young Money, it's been the short flat tracks that were the last to come around. He was good at intermediate tracks early on. As soon as he joined with Hendrick, he was great at, at road courses. I mean, he was good at road courses with CGR, just never had the equipment. Short flat tracks, it's taken him a while to develop. But last year, he did get the Richmond win. He did get the Martinsville win. He got a Phoenix win a couple of years ago. So that's coming along. But if I had to say there was one weakness outside of plate racing, for Kyle Larson, this would be the type of track. And for that reason, I'd give a little bit of the nudge to William Byron. And also, it just appears that they are closer in setup. That's going to do it. Remember, 
racefieldprize.com. That's where you can get access to the fancy NASCAR spreadsheet for Richmond, 10 bucks. Or maybe you want to sandwich that in or combo that in with the April package. Just email me. We'll work something out. DM me. April package is up on the site. Please leave a like. Subscribe if you haven't. Half of you have not subscribed. Subscribe. Share these videos. I'm very blessed to have you guys around. I love you guys. Trip to life fantastic.